brothers and sisters and uh, young people and friends, we're going to have a look now at uh, Joshua 6 and 7. Joshua 6 uh, is the Armageddon chapter of the book of Joshua, and Joshua 7 is the cleansing of Judah chapter. And I'm just going to summarise what uh, the content of these two chapters uh, is so that we can give you the broad summary at the front and then proceed to the detail. Joshua 6, of course, sees Jericho overthrown by an earthquake, <coughs> undermining the walls of the city. We find there are seven priests, seven trumpets, seven days and seven times around the city, which I will demonstrate, we believe we can demonstrate this very plainly, prefigure the beginning of the of the seventh seal, the seventh trumpet, the, se the, the seven vials, the seven thunders of the apocalypse. In other words, the pouring out of the seventh vial, all of those seals, trumpets, vials, and the seven thunders are going to have their beginning to, to be brought to their completion. We're going to demonstrate that. But we're also going to show that in Joshua chapter 6, <laughs> some Babylonian elements survive. And that, of course, is exactly what's going to happen. Armageddon is going to see the destruction of human infrastructure. Uh, it's going to begin the process of 40 years of judgment, the pouring out of the seven thunder judgments, for example. But some Babylonian elements will survive Armageddon, and we'll have a look at that in some detail. Joshua 7 <coughs> sees the sin of Achan revealed and the family of Judah cleansed. This is a type of the Jews in the land who have been humbled by defeat in war uh, at the time of Armageddon. And then, of course, the very first thing that Christ does post-Armageddon, having established the throne of David, is to call the remnant, the third who will survive those events, and goes about the process of cleansing them. All right? So we're going to see that all revealed in Joshua chapter 7. Now, the one thing that's quite remarkable about this, well, it's not remarkable really, is it? is that if you understand the prophetic framework that our pioneer brethren laid down of old, which is spelled out uh, uh, in other works, if you have a look at my book of events subsequent, you'll see the same framework. We've just taken it from the writings of John Thomas and others, Brother H. B. Mansfield in particular. Uh, that framework, where you, wherever you go in the Word of God, you find it exactly. Whether you be in the book of Judges, whether you're in Genesis, whether you're in Kings, or here in Joshua, if you understand the prophetic framework, you're going to find it confirmed and verified every single time that you look at a book like this. And that's one of the great values of this study. We know that what our pioneers laid down in terms of a prophetic framework is right, because it's found everywhere in the Word of God. We don't need any of these newfangled ideas that have been around now for a few decades. None of that. We don't need that. We just need to go back to our roots and get our heads in the Bible and we find that they got it right. It's as simple as that. Well, what about this place, Jericho? We're in, Je in Joshua 6, verse 1. Now Jericho was straightly shut up because of the children of Israel. None went out and none came in. In the Hebrew, that's actually in parenthesis. A little verse popped in parenthesis, brackets around it. Why? Well, you see, it introduces this place, Jericho, a very, very important place. The name means it's moon or month. In other words, it's time. The time has come for this city. It's, uh, in American terms, it's five miles, uh, eight kilometres if you're an Australian or a Canadian. It's five miles west of Jordan, or 11.5 kilometres or seven miles north of the Dead Sea. <coughs> There are 57 occurrences in the Old Testament of the name Jericho, and 29 of those are in the book of Joshua. And Joshua 6 verse 1 just happens to be the 21st occurrence. Now that's the beginning of this chapter, which is the chapter of sevens. 21 is three times seven, isn't it? Jericho just happened to be the centre of Baal worship in the land of Canaan. You want to go and find Baal in the land of Canaan in the times when Israel crossed the Jordan? You went to Jericho. Which, of course, is why it's devoted to utter destruction. So here we've got the beginning of the chapter of sevens. I want to point out just how many sevens there are in this chapter. And it's a good exercise, actually, to do a little bit of scribbling in your Bible, a little bit of highlighting, because this is what it wants to tell us. In verse 4, you read this. And, the, and seven priests shall bear before the ark seven trumpets of ram's horns, and the seventh day ye shall compass the city seven times. 
So you see the emphasis on seven? Well, it just so happens that the word seven or seventh occurs 14 times in the chapter. Two times seven. And of course, 14 happens also to be the biblical number for the certainty of covenant. If you double something in the word of God, you make it sure and certain because it's from God. We know that from Genesis 41 and verse 32. Because the dream, Pharaoh, has doubled unto thee twice, which is an oxymoron, doubled unto thee twice, the thing is from God, it is sure, it is certain. Well, seven, of course, quite apart from being the spirit number, we know is the number of the Abrahamic covenant, or covenant generally. And so here you've got certainty of covenant. And that's what Armageddon's about. It's going to be the greatest event, you know, the appearance of Christ with the saints. At the Mount of Olives, the greatest event this world's ever seen, he will come to be king. And that's the way it will all begin. So it's going to be quite dramatic. So we, we pointed out in verse 4, you have seven priests, seven trumpets, seven days. There are seven times around the city. And this word trumpets, shofar, means a ram's horn, which was just blown a little while ago by Jason very successfully, only occurs uh, in Joshua chapter 6, in the book of Joshua. You don't find this word anywhere else in the book of Joshua. And it happens to be here in this chapter, well, amazingly, well, not really, 14 times you find this word shofar in Joshua chapter 6. Again, the number of the certainty of covenant. Now, there's another term here, ram's horns, that we read in verse 4. Ram's horns. This is the Hebrew word yobel, from which we get jubilee. Okay? So, it means a, a ram's horn, a trumpet, or a corner. It was blown at the time of jubilee. There happens to be five occurrences in Joshua 6 of that word, yobel. Okay? Five is the number of them this time. Again, he'll get it right, Garth. Grace. And the word compass, sabab in Hebrew, meaning to go around, of course, that occurs seven times uh, in this chapter. You think this is accidental? Well, of course not. And in verse 6 we read this. And Joshua the son of Nun called the priests and said unto them, Take up the Ark of the Covenant uh, and let seven priests bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the Ark of Yahweh and so on. Well, we've got Joshua the son of Nun mentioned again. As we pointed out, Nun means perpetuity. It's about eternal life. Its numerical value in Hebrew happens to be 50. Okay? Well, then we come to this Ark of the Covenant. The term ark occurs ten times in the chapter. So I'm going to make a little hint here. We've got this word yobel, jubilee, all right, five times grace. We've got ark, that's the, the symbol for Christ and the saints in glory, all right, we know that that's the case because of chapter five, all right. Well, the numerical value of Joshua the son of Nun, perpetuity, is 50, yep. When I went to school, five times ten was fifty. All right. For those who are there with our Lord Jesus Christ, grace has been delivered to them in abundance. All right. They're all part of a vast multitude. Most of them will end up coming with him from Sinai to the Mount of Olives, and they're going to see these things happen before their very eyes. Joshua chapter 6 is about a jubilee year, brothers and sisters. It's about the time of the delivery of Israel. And Christ and the saints will come to the Mount of Olives to accomplish that. That's what this chapter is about. It's the Armageddon chapter of the book of Joshua. So how do we then come and establish this matter of uh, the seven uh, seals, the seven trumpets, the seven vials and the seven thunder judgments. Well, I think they're here. We have seven priests. So what's the role of a priest? Well, we're told what the role of a priest is in Malachi 2 verse 7. Priests' lips should keep knowledge, we are told. But there were priests in Israel who didn't keep knowledge. In Isaiah 29 verse 11, we read of, of a priest being given the scroll. And he said, oh no, I can't give you an explanation of that. It's sealed. Idiot. <laughs> His role as a priest was to unseal the word. Right? He's an idiot. That's why he's there. Why do you pay him if he can't do it? Alright, that's, that's the point being made here. So what's the role of a priest? To unseal. Yeah. So I think you can relate the seven priests to the seven seals of Revelation chapter 6. Alright? 
So you've got priests, read, seals. That's what a priest should be doing, unsealing. Well, I don't have to explain the next one, do I? Because what comes after the seven seals in the apocalypse? Well, seven trumpets. That's the second thing mentioned. That's Revelation 8 and 9. Well, then we've got seven days. Now, these seven days were days of preparation for the final judgment, weren't they? So every time that Israel got up in the morning for that six days before the final day, what did they do? They marched around the city once. Went back to their camp. Next day, they marched around the city once. People on the wall looking at us saying, what's this all about? Well, it's a preparation for the judgment. You know, the seven vials of the wrath of God began in 1789 with the French Revolution. Vial 1 began in 1789. The second vial was 17, uh, is this right? 1793 to 1805. The third vial was the work of Napoleon. So was the fourth and the fifth led to the abolition of the Holy Roman Empire in 1806 and the banishment of the Pope in 1809. The sixth file of the wrath of God began in when? 1820. It's nearly 200 years ago. Well, what were they about? Well, go and have a look at Revelation 15 and 16. They were the vials of the wrath of God. In other words, God's judgments against the harlot system, the Catholic system, began, brothers and sisters, in 1789. That's what the vials were. Just like the six days they marched around the city once, it's the preparation for judgment, for final judgment. That final judgment, of course, comes on the seventh day, doesn't it? The beginning of the seventh day. Seventh day, they go around the city seven times. Yes, it points to the seven thunder judgments of the seventh vial. In other words, the seven campaigns that Christ will conduct. Just like Joshua conducted seven campaigns to take the land of Canaan. Just like David had seven campaigns to subdue the nations around him. Yeah, it was all there typified in the word of God. So the seven thunder judgments of Revelation chapter 10 speak of those seven campaigns. So in the seven priests, seven trumpets, seven days... And seven, and, and seven times around the city, we've got the beginning, the beginning of the wrapping up of divine judgment. We've got the events that are immediately in front of us, brothers and sisters. Because you read in Revelation 16, verse 17, that the seventh angel, the vile angel, poured out his vial. Okay? And that begins the 40 years of divine judgment. That's when your thunder judgments are poured out. From that point, from Armageddon. See why that's here? Joshua chapter 6 is your Armageddon chapter in the book of Joshua. Now some would say, well, yeah, look, look, Brother Jim, that sounds nice, but you haven't really proven it to me yet. Well, hang on, hang on. I don't make statements. You know I don't make statements I can't prove. You're not going to hear my opinions. You hear my opinion, you must get anybody's opinion. I don't want to hear opinions. I want to hear what the Bible's got to say, all right? And so should you. And you can hold me to that. Hold me to the flame. Ask me to prove it from the Bible. If I can't, well, then I should shut up and sit down. So I'm not going to sit down because I can prove it to you from the Bible. So let's, let's have a look at it. I know there are certain in this room who would like me to sit down, but <laughs> I won't mention any names. <laughs> I want you to have a look with me at Joshua chapter 6. Let's, let's prove this. Joshua chapter 6 and verse 18 says this. Maybe just uh, go back to verse 17, just to pick up the context. And the city shall be accursed, even it and all that are therein, to Yahweh. Only Rahab the harlot shall live, she and all that are with her in the house, because she hid the messengers that we sent. And ye in any wise keep yourselves from the accursed thing, lest ye make yourselves accursed, when ye take of the accursed thing and make the camp of Israel a curse and trouble of it. So... So, this accursed thing, this is the Hebrew word kerem. Now, kerem is actually the last word of the Old Testament as we have it. It's the last word of Malachi chapter 4. Lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. Now, it's not the case. The Hebrew Bible actually ends with Second Chronicles, but our Bible, that's the last word of the Old Testament in Hebrew. So it's a pretty important word. It actually means a thing devoted or dedicated, therefore, to utter destruction. And that was, that was the fate of Jericho. It was dedicated to utter destruction. Well, why? Well, because of the next verse, verse 19. 
But all the silver and gold and vessels of brass and iron are consecrated unto Yahweh. They shall come into the treasury of Yahweh. Now, what are these? Well, these are four metals. And I don't think I needed to tell you what those four metals are. They happen to be the four metals of Nebuchadnezzar's image. Yes. Your gold, your silver, your brass and your iron. All right? Just happens to be the metals of Nebuchadnezzar's image. Which represents what? The kingdom of men. Standing up in the latter days to be destroyed by Christ and the saints and to be subsumed into the kingdom of God. Now use that word, subsumed. I want to show you why that's appropriate to this context. Look at verse 24. Now, wouldn't it be adequate to be told that once, the four medals of the image? Do you think it'd be adequate? Well, yeah, I think so. But you see, the Spirit puts in the second top. Look at verse 24 of Joshua 6. <coughs> and they burnt the city with fire, and all that was therein, only the silver and the gold and the vessels of brass and of iron, they put into the treasury of the house of Yahweh. Which, of course, is what verse 19 said that they were going to do. Put it into the treasury. Okay, so twice we read about the metals of Nebuchadnezzar's image. I don't think there's any doubt this context is about Armageddon. Right? So what happens to these, these metals? Well, they're put into the treasury. They're consecrated. The word Kodesh means holiness or put apart. They're separated. Yeah, into the treasury, the depository or the storehouse of Yahweh. So what is going to happen to the kingdom of men, brethren and sisters? Well, it's, going to be, it's going to be put in the treasury of Yahweh's storehouse, isn't it? I want to show you that. In Revelation 11, verse 15, this is what we read in the literal translations. Now, there's something you can do in your Bible if you have the authorised translation, the, the King James. You can cross the S off the word kingdoms. There's only one kingdom of men, all right? Just one kingdom of men. Well, there are many nations that make up the kingdom of men that, that Nimrod established. But there's only one kingdom of men and it's going to be subsumed into the kingdom of God. So we read in Revelation 11.15 in Rotherham's translation the kingdom of the world hath become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ and he shall reign unto the age of ages. The RSV has it the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord etc. The Diagla has became the kingdom of the world of the Lord of us etc. In other words it all of those translations recognise one simple fact. That the word kingdom there is singular. It's not plural. There's only one kingdom of men. And all nations belong to it. What's going to happen to it? Well, it's going to become the kingdom of God. It's going to be subsumed into the... What's that? Well, it's putting it into the treasury of Yahweh, isn't it? Just like the gold, the silver, the iron and the brass in Joshua chapter 6 were put into the treasury of Yahweh. How accurate can you be? I mean, how accurate is that? Well, there's a lot more to come. It's exactly like that. So what survives Jericho, brethren and sisters? Well, I ask you a question. What will survive Armageddon? Well, Babylon the Great. Yeah, they'll be damaged, but they will survive Armageddon. Gog's host won't. Gog will be destroyed in the land. Now, the answer is... The system of Babylon the Great in the form of papal rebellion against the rule of Christ. Now, in a moment I'm going to take you to Psalm 2, verses 1 to 6. We're going to have a look at what they're going to do post Armageddon. But have a look at this chart here on the, on the bottom of this slide. Here is Armageddon. Now of course Christ has returned ten years prior to this to raise the dead and to do all the things he has to do. But he appears with his saints at the Mount of Olives at the time when the mountain splits and you've got Armageddon. Okay? That's going to be a huge blow to, to, to Catholicism. But it's not going to stop them. The Pope will convene a council and they will get together in an attempt to overthrow this new proclaimed ruler in Jerusalem. You know, they're, going to, they're going to bring to the fore their false doctrine of Antichrist, aren't they? they? They'll be teaching their people. The Jesuits have been pretty good at that. They'll be teaching their people this is going to happen. Well, of course, ten years after Armageddon, Revelation 14 verse 8 tells us that Rome itself will be totally destroyed. And the Pope that happens to be there at that time may be the leader of this rebellion. He goes down the gurgler. Alright? He's gone. So is Rome. Does that stop them? No. The Catholics resort to Central Europe. It's a big blow. Yeah. 
that they resort to Central Europe, probably Germany, and they begin all over again. Elect their new Pope and go on with their rebellion. So that's why you've got a 30-year period. It's called the Hour of Judgment in Revelation chapter 14, 17 and 18. 30-year period of judgment. And it just so happens that the vehicle of judgment will be Israel returning under Elijah through the wilderness of the peoples. That's the divine instrument of judgment, overshadowed by the saints. Got a picture? All right? All of that. All of that here is in the book of Joshua. So we're going to see. You know, it says, it says that Achan preserved what? A wedge of gold, silver, and a goodly Babylonian garment. We're going to look at the details of that in a minute. Goodly Babylonian garment. So he, he preserved a priestly robe, silver and gold. That identifies the latter day Catholic system. That's what rep what's represented here in the type. And here you've got, of course, the still alive but no longer Pope, Benedict XVI. And what does it say? Well, look at him. I mean, he's arrayed in what? Red and gold, all sorts of other fangle jangles, right? Exactly as Revelation 17 verse 4 says. Arrayed in purple and scarlet colour and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls. So you see, when Achan took the wedge of gold and silver, which should have been put into the treasury of Yahweh, the, the gold and silver, all right, and a goodly Babylonian garment, he was preserving the system of Baal, Babylon. All right, that was the very centre of Baal worship in the land of Canaan. So let's have a look at this. <clears throat> let's come to Joshua chapter 6 and read again verse 17. And the city shall be accursed, even it and all that are therein, to Yahweh. Only Rahab the harlot shall live, she and all that are with her in the house. Now, who, do they, who does Rahab and her people, her family, represent here, do you think? Well, her name means broad and large, also insolence and pride, as the Egyptians. In fact, this word is used in relation to Egypt in Isaiah 51, verse 9. Now... That's, that's very important, you see, because I believe that Rahab and her family here represent the Jews who survive Armageddon. And the reason that two-thirds of them have been wiped out in those events is because of their pride and their arrogance and their irreligious approach and their denial that they're there because God's hand got them there. They think their own hand got them there. All right? They act like Egyptians. And that's why the judgments come. But there is a remnant preserved, isn't there? And I believe she and her family represent that remnant. You see, it says in Zechariah 12, verse 7, doesn't it, that Christ, Christ shall save the tents of Judah first. And the next chapter tells us who they are. It's the third who survive. Chapter 12 also tells us that they go apart, in houses apart, and they mourn for a long, long time. Now, I don't need to remind you that when Rahab finally did get into the camp of Israel, for the time being, she and her family were put outside the camp. They were unclean. All right? They were unclean. They needed to be cleansed and brought into the camp of Israel. When she did come into the camp, who did she marry? Well, she married Salmon. Who was he? He was a prince of Judah. All right? So she became part of the tribe of Judah in due course. Now, she's described here as a harlot. That's exactly what the Jews in the land are today, aren't they? They were when God put, called them out of Egypt. In Jeremiah 2.20, he says, I called a harlot. Oh, this is not the exact words, but this is paraphrasing. He called a harlot out of Egypt. That's why he got Hosea to take a harlot, because God had married a harlot when he called her out of Egypt and brought her to Sinai. Okay? So the people in the land today are like a harlot, both past and present, of course. It tells us in verse 20, let's just read on down here, come to verse 20. So the people shouted when the priest blew with the trumpets, and it came to pass, when the people heard the sound of the trumpet and the people shouted with a great shout, that the wall fell down flat. In other words, there's an earthquake that undermines that wall. So the people went up into the city, every man straight before him, and they took the city. So... The, the earthquake of Armageddon is going to have huge consequences, not only for the land, but for the people there, with Gog's host, the, the, the seven million Jews that are there. Uh, they're going to suffer dreadfully. But a remnant, a remnant will come through that Holocaust. It says in verse 23, 
Joshua instructs the two spies to go to the house of, of Rahab. So she's, she's got a house on the wall, so that part of the wall doesn't fall down. And in verse 23 we read this. And the young men that were spies went in and brought out Rahab and her father and her mother and her brethren and all that she had. And they brought out all her kindred and left them without the camp of Israel. Yep, they're outside because they're unclean. Well, guess what Zechariah 12 verse 12 says about the Jews that survive Armageddon when they come to meet their Messiah. They are in houses apart. And in actual fact, the Hebrew word is used there 11 times in Zechariah 12. Why? Well, because 11 is a number of failure. They've got to go into houses apart and mourn until they realise their failure, their pride and their arrogance. So they might be recovered and redeemed. It's exactly what Christ is going to do with the remnant. And that's what he does here. He takes, sends the spies out like the saints will be dealing with the Jews that are left and they, they go through the process of cleansing Rahab's house, just like Christ will go through the process of cleansing the Jews left in the land. Now, do you reckon, do you reckon that this record is, is complete? Well, I want to show you verse 18 of Joshua chapter 2. Come back to Joshua 2. We've just been talking about Rahab. Well, when she entertained the spies, she's going to read one verse out of Joshua 2. Verse 18. Behold, when we come into the land, the spies say to Rahab, Thou shalt bind this line of scarlet thread in the window which thou didst let us down by, and thou shalt bring thy father, thy mother, thy brethren into thy, into thy household. If you bring him here, they'll survive. Now this word line here, in Joshua 2 verse 18, see this line of scarlet thread, <laughs> just happens to be the Hebrew word tikvah. I don't need to, to tell too many people what that word means in Hebrew. It means hope, right? Now, literally, it refers to a cord as an attachment, but figuratively, the word refers to expectancy or hope. There are 34 occurrences of this word tikvah in the Old Testament. Here are two translated line in Joshua 2. It's twice in Joshua 2. Expectation, expected, hope, 22 times. Thing that I long for. Yeah, that's how this word is rendered elsewhere in the Old Testament in the King James Version. And the last occurrence is in Zechariah 9, 9 verse 12, where the Jews are called the prisoners of Tikvah, the prisoners of hope. So when Rahab took that red cord and hung it in the window, she was displaying her belief in what? In the hope of Israel. That's what she was displaying. The red cord is a graphic symbol for the hope of Israel. And Paul said, I am bound with a chain for one thing. The hope of Israel. She displays it to the world. What will be the basis on which Christ will redeem the Jews who survive Armageddon? The hope of Israel. The Abrahamic promises. Now this, this line, this tikvah of hope, is scarlet, crimson. And the first two occurrences, of course, of that word in the Old Testament, Shani, are back in Genesis 38, verses 28 and 30. That's when you've got the birth of Zarah. Right? But he's the second born. He was going to be the first, but he's the second born. He's pushed out of the way by his brother. Remember? Yeah. What tribe's he of? Who's he the son of? Judah. All right? Judah. Won't go into all the details of that. That's enough. This word thread means a line or a string. I want you to come to chapter 7 of Joshua now. I want to see how this plays out in the, in the treachery, and that's what it was, the treachery of Achan. Joshua chapter 7, verse 1, you read this. But the children of Israel committed a trespass in the accursed thing, for Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zarah, what tribes he of? Of the tribe of Judah took the accursed thing. And the anger of Yahweh was kindled against the children of Israel. Look at verse 15. And it shall be that he that is taken with the accursed thing shall be burnt with fire, he that all that he hath, because he hath transgressed the covenant of Yahweh and because he hath wrought folly in Israel. That's what they do. They had a great assize. So what Achan did, we all know. 
Alright? It was treachery, this word trespass we just read in these two verses, mayal means treachery of the worst kind. He preserved the tokens of the Babylonian religion out of Jericho that God sought to utterly destroy or, in the case of the gold and silver, to put into his treasury because it represents, of course, the kingdom of men. That's what he did. Now, of course, you well know that this carries us off into the Apocalypse, the book of Revelation. Revelation 17, verse 4, uh, we've made mention of. Chapter 18, verses 12 and 16 speak of the incredible wealth of the system of Catholicism. And that's going to go on after Armageddon. Well, Achan preserves it. So you see, there is an exact type. This, this term, a cursed thing, is this word kerim again, a thing devoted to destruction that we met back in Joshua 6, verse 17. And who is doing all of this? Well, a, a troubler. A troubler of Israel. That's what the name Achan means. He's of the, he's the tribe of Judah. He's a Zahite. Takes us right back to the birth of Zarah, Genesis 38, verse 30. So, in summary, Rahab was saved out of Babylon, because that's what Jericho really was, the centre of Baal worship in Canaan, with a red cord of faith in the hope of Israel. Achan was destroyed with Jericho because of his grief towards a red robe. And it doesn't say red robe, does it, in Joshua 7? Or does it? Let's have a look. Verse 21. Joshua 7, verse 21. When I saw among the spoils, and this is Achan's confession, a goodly Babylonian garment and 200 shekels of silver and a wedge of gold of 50 shekels weight, then I coveted them and took them, and behold, they hid in the earth in the midst of my tent, and the silver under it, as his confession, and of course he ends up being stoned to death, and his family with him, because they knew he put it there. So, you know, the, the tribe of Judah is purged. Because that's the tribe he comes from. They were the corrupt one. It's purged. All right. So what is this Babylonian garment? Well, the two Hebrew words are Shina and Areth. It means a splendid and costly robe of the land of Shina. And the Vulgate Latin version calls it a scarlet robe. Well, was it scarlet? Well, yes, because of this name, this word, Shina. You see, Shina, brothers and sisters, is the Hebrew form of the name of Nimrod's wife, Semiramis. All right? Semiramis is the Hellenized form of the Akkadian name. That's the original language of, of that area back there near Babylon. Semel Amat. When you take this Akkadian word, Semur, and translate it into Hebrew, it becomes Shina. Now, I can give you the, the reference to go and check this out if you want. Now, it just so happens that Semiramis had an inner circle of priests. She had two orders of priests, just like the Catholic Church, because that's where they got it from. She had an inner circle of priests who had access to her and they controlled the door. Nobody could get in the door except through these priests. And they had a particular uh, garment that they wore to distinguish them. It was red, a red robe, like the cardinals wear, by the way, when they walk in and close the door to elect a new Nimrod. Okay? Just like they wear. I'll come to the word cardinals in a minute. So she had this inner circle of priests and she had an outer circle of priests. They were the ones outside the door. They had to tend the sacrificial fires. So they wore black because you get, you know, your garments tend to get dirty when you're tending fires. And charcoal doesn't show up on a black garment. It shows up on a red. Okay? That's how she had set up her priesthood. Jericho was the centre of Baal worship in Canaan. That came from Nimrod and Semiramis and Nimrod's father, Cush. Hence the decree devoted to destruction. And Achan preserves it. That's what he preserves. Baal, of course, or Bel, as it's spelled out in the Word of God in various places in Isaiah and Jeremiah, was a title of Cush and of Nimrod. You get an idea of how serious this was? The kind of treachery that was involved? In Achan, the trouble of Israel doing what he did? Yeah. Well, a great Azaz is held. You look at Joshua chapter 7 and verse 14. It says this. In the morning, therefore, ye shall be brought according to your tribes, and it shall be the tribe which Yahweh taketh shall come according to the families thereof. What tribe was that? Judah. Judah. Exactly. 
And the course goes on to talk about how they're going to sort that all out. Now, it just so happens that the word families that occurs down in the body of verse 14, families and family is mishpatah. It means a clan or a family or a tribe. That is used nine times in Zechariah 12, verses 12 to 14. Every family apart. Remember that? This is the third who survive Armageddon. They come before Christ. Someone asked him, what are those wounds in your hand? He says, these are the wounds I received in the house of my friends. And then they'll go into a great mourning like they did for Josiah, he says. Every family apart. That's the word. Right? It's used nine times in Zechariah 12. So it's typical of the Assize after Armageddon when the rent and the land appear before Christ. And they're sorted out and cleansed. I want to show you some more details here. Verse 16 identifies the tribe. It says the tribe of Judah was taken. Judah happens to be the title of the Jews in the land at the time of Armageddon. Verse 18 talks about Achan. His name means a troubler. Guess how many times in the Old Testament? Six. What's that the number of? Man. What man? A Babylonian man whose number is six. 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 Revelation 13, verse 18. This is the man who preserves Babylon. Alright? How detailed is that? Make confession, he's told in verse 19. This is a type of the events post Armageddon. Now maybe, I haven't got this underlined, but maybe we've got time to have a look at Zechariah 13. Have a look at Zechariah 13. We've been making mention of Zechariah 12. In the hope that you're very familiar with it, and I'm sure you are. Because Zechariah 12, from verse 10 onwards, describes the surviving Jews, the one-third of chapter 13, verse 8, the one-third of the events of Armageddon, that is described what, that describes what happens when they come before Christ. Verses 10 through to 14 of Zechariah 12. But then look what happens in chapter 13. It says in verse 2 of chapter 13, it shall come to pass in that day, saith Yahweh of hosts, that I will cut off the names of the idols, oh, the idols out of the land, yes, and they shall no more be remembered, and also I will cause the prophets and the unclean spirit to pass out of the land. Let's read on. It shall come to pass that when any shall yet prophesy, then his father and his mother that begat him shall say unto him, Thou shalt not live. For thou speakest lies in the name of Yahweh, and his father and his mother that began him shall thrust him through when he prophesied. And it shall come to pass in that day that the prophets shall be ashamed, every one of his vision, when he hath prophesied, neither shall they wear a rough garment to deceive. Rough garment? Yeah. But he shall say, I am no prophet, I am a husbandman. In other words, he makes a confession. For man taught me to keep cattle from my youth. What's that about? Well, it's about what Christ is going to do to cleanse the remnant of Judah in the land post Armageddon. All right? He's going to sort them out. He's going to get rid of all the false prophets that still remain. In other words, when they stoned Achan and his family, that was a type of things to come. Things that are going to happen in the future. You know, we're going to be standing there watching all this happen, brethren and sisters. And that's why back in Joshua chapter... Uh, 7, it says in verse 25, all Israel stoned him with stones. And in Zechariah 13, verse 3, we just read that his father and mother thrust him through. Alright? Got a picture? Well, let's just finish off on chapter 7. <clears throat> because you see, in Joshua chapter 7 and verse 26, we read this. And they raised over him, that is over Achan, a great heap of stones unto this day. So Yahweh turned from the fierceness of his anger, wherefore the name of that place was called the Valley of Achor unto this day. Now, you're aware, aren't you, that the Valley of Achor plays a very prominent part in the redemption of Israel. So when they buried Achan, the troubler, in the Valley of Achor, we're going to see a little bit more of this in our next study because we're going to see that Israel comes up the Valley of Achor to attack Ai, led by Joshua. All right? So that's going to come back into view. So this valley becomes very, very important in the scheme of things. 
I don't need to tell you that there are prophecies about this. Hosea 11 verse 9 says that when Elijah brings back Ephraim, or the Jews, to the land, when he finally gets them back and he's baptised them in the Euphrates or in the Red Sea, he brings them to the borders of the land to the east, and they're brought into the bonds of the covenant, then they're going to come up the valley of Achor. That's what Hosea says in chapter 2 verse 15. Yahweh will speak under their heart, it says. And Elijah will have completed his work, almost completed his work, and he will bring the Jews up the valley of Achor. That's why it says it will be a door of hope. The valley of Achor, trouble, cognate of Achan, is clearly a play on that name in this context. So, brethren and sisters, I know that's, a pretty, that's it's pretty quick. Pretty quick. We've covered that ground uh, fairly quickly. If you have any knowledge at all of the framework of Bible prophecy, you can see that it fits exactly where it should. That's why we know it's right. That's why we know our framework is right. Because it doesn't matter where you go, whether it be Joshua or Judges or anywhere else in the Old Testament, it's always going to be the same message. That's the beauty of it, isn't it? You and I will see the day. If we're there... As immortals, we've had our second circumcision. You and I will see the day when the new generation of Jews, because the older generation, just like the first exodus, will have been purged out in the 40-year second exodus that Elijah will lead. He will have brought them through the body of Europe, the wilderness of the peoples, and purged out the rebels. We're going to see a new and refreshed people, refreshed like their brethren 40 years or so before who after Armageddon met their Messiah and he cleansed them. It's going to take another 40 years or so, nearly 40 years, for Elijah to do the same with the Jews who are outside the land. We're going to see them come up that valley of Achor. And they're going to come up when the temple is about to go into operation. And then, brothers and sisters, we're going to see a scene like that of Joseph when he encountered his brethren. And they got to know who he was. And he wept on them they wept on him. It was great joy. All of that trouble, all of that Achanism, the trouble that they've gone through, that being used as the weapon against Babylon the Great, now culminates in meeting their Messiah. Won't that be a terrific day? It's all in the book of Joshua. And that's why the next section of Joshua, when we come to chapter 8, is all about covenants of hope and redemption. That's why it's about covenants of hope and redemption. So that's where we'll go next, God willing.